Are we done yet? Not if you're a gardener. Fall has its own to-do list for the active gardener. We visit with Jan McNeilan again about some fall gardening tips to help you get ready for spring. We also talk about a few common gardening myths and how they can be a detriment to maintaining a healthy garden. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru in Salem, Oregon. Capital Subaru knows the details matter to you. And that's why you chose a Subaru for their top safety ratings and well-earned reputation. Capital Subaru has the Valley's largest inventory of new and used vehicles, but we're so much more than just a great dealership. Check out some of our amazing relaxation spaces, like our Happy Heart Coffee Cart, the Outback Dog Park, or our fantastic Happy Paws Pet Store. It's all here at Capital Subaru, your place to expect the unexpected. Your way, every day, on the Parkway. Welcome to the Garden Time Podcast. We're based in the Pacific Northwest of the United States in a Zone 8 region. This zone deals with plants that can survive in 10 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer. I'm producer Jeff Gustin with your hosts Judy Alaruzzo and Ryan Seeley. Welcome to the Garden Time Podcast. Jeff Gustin, producer here. I've been sitting out the last couple. These guys have taken over. I've had a lot of work behind the camera. Um, we're at Portland Nursery on Division Street, and we're meeting with Jan McNeilan, a uh, retired OSU Extension agent, and we're talking fall. And so fall into winter, major changes for the gardener. Um, we're going to talk first about some tips that gardeners can do this time of year. And a lot of these we've already talked about in other sure. times, but it's still nice as a reminder. Every time you hear something, you'll learn a little more. Yeah. Yeah. And it sticks. Yeah. I, Hopefully. I'm, I'm one of those guys that needs to be told <laughs> 10 does. times. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the things we're getting into fall now plant-wise that people should be worried about or should be doing? No worries. No, uh, good idea. No worries. Um, <laughs> this is a time of year where it's really easy to go, whoa, it's raining and now I don't have to do anything and, and boy, that feels good and, and don't have to be out there every day. Um, but you can be if that's what you want to do. Um, you can do some uh, just clean up in the vegetable garden. You can clean up the d disease plants or obviously zucchini always gets mildew. Um, so pull them and, and then dispose of them. Don't put them on your compost because you don't want to spread it for the next year. So you can look at diseases, insect issues that you may have had changes you'd like to make for the following year. Um, there's just a lot of things you can do. We are talking about vegetables and on the way here, Judy is in the car, Ryan's in the car, we're talking about bringing in your tomatoes. And, uh, you know, because with the rain they could split, mm -hmm. you know, especially if you have larger uh, heirloom varieties. Um, bringing them in and having them ripen indoors. And we've talked about this before and it's really easy to do. Well, sure, it, all you have to do uh, it, if a tomato is that kind of translucent green, it will turn red. If it's a really dark, solid, hard tomato that's darker green, um, it may not, um, but it's worth a try instead of just waiting to see. Um, so you can bring them in and people do a lot of different ways. I just bring them in and set them on the counter, wait till one at a time. And then I free, for the most part at this time of year, I freeze them. Mm. Uh, I just quarter the tomatoes. I don't peel them. I don't anything. I just throw them in a Ziploc bag and throw them in, in the freezer. And I make sauces and soups and it's fine. And if the skins usually break down when you're cooking them anyway. Uh, so that's one of the things that I do this time of year. And then I, I just was traveling and came back and picked a whole bunch of tomatillos and I, I quartered them up this morning and, and I want to make a salsa ver verde with them and I managed to burn the whole pot and now oh. I will <laughs> soak the pot with some ammonia and uh, oh. now though I have lots more to come in the garden. So. Well, this year, instead of just picking the green tomatoes, I took the whole stems yeah. and I have a you basement. Can, can, and so I'm going to try that. Can you ha technique. hang them? Well, I kind of have my tomato cages upside down and Got I kind of hung them on that. Okay. And I put a yeah. fan on because they were very wet. And yeah. We'll see what happens. The wet, yeah, wet will get them for yeah. sure. But whatever you bring in, 
um, just check it regularly mm -hmm. and get rid of whatever isn't happy and keep the rest. Yeah, they might end up upstairs. And yeah, I, and I yeah. know that uh, things like yeah. carrots and stuff you can leave in the garden. Potatoes you can leave. In the I garden. always leave them. Yeah, until yeah. you use them. Uh, in fact, the carrots I think become a little sweeter after a frost. I think so too. Yeah, yeah. and uh, squashes sure. and that kind of stuff. They are the harder skin. winter yeah, squash. The winter yeah, squashes, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then before I left, I. Um, I planted carrots and I planted beets and kale and chard and garlic. And I, I think that was the first part of September. So oh. um, I think, and they're coming up. So Excellent. somebody watered for me while I was yeah. gone. <laughs> you know, took advantage of the warmer weather right. and the warmer yeah, soil nice temperatures. To... Right, right. And we'll see how they do. It's worth trying. And then the other thing I'm going to do is, um, you guys know about the plum tree that I lost last year well it shaded out the lawn so the lawn is not lawn and so up to about October 15th you can seed new lawn for and it'll be warm enough to, to come up and hopefully I'll be able to mow it but I'm going to overseed too some of the lawn that's still there so it doesn't look like there's the new patch and here's the old patch so yeah, and I think a lot of people, they, they have a bare spot and they just seed the bare spot. Right. And you said before, you know, just go a little bit wider yeah, and yeah. it helps blend that right. that new grass. That's in. a great right. tip. Now, it's, you know, with your, with your plum tree and that's leaf back in, do you want to do anything with those, like as far as the pruning on the tree, if you want to allow more light in? Is this the time of year to be It doing? died. It fell over. But well, if you had not. a big tree that but was if shaded, you had, if you had a big tree that was shaded, I was going to say, you <laughs> still, still there, not there anymore. But, but if you have, have those areas that you know, sure. you're starting to get a lot of sure. shade now, it's sure. fall the time to start, sure. start doing some pruning. Sure, you can thin it out um, probably a little more in the winter when it's dormant than you do now. Um, so, and then maybe seed in the spring for the grass after you've done the pruning. Yeah. Up, not not up, go up. trample your new grass. Right, you. exactly. <laughs> you can start uh, seeding lawns about the 15th of April. Huh. So, but we also window. talked about, you mentioned dormant um, trees. And dormant spring, you really don't need to do in the fall. You're, you're kind of waiting, because if you apply it now, wouldn't it just be washed away with winter It rains? depends on what you're spraying for. Okay. Um, and so you need to read the label directions, see what the timing is, because there's horticultural oils, there's sulfur products, all sorts of things for uh, for different problems. So you have to identify what that is first. And the website, the OSU website is yeah. great for that, Oregon mm -hmm. State, mm -hmm. all that information. You know, now, you, you know, changing like after we've just had a lot of rain here in the last week, we went kind of flipped the switch from that late summer, now it's it's definitely feels fall and the temperatures drop 10 to 20 degrees. And my, a lot of my, you know, annuals and my perennials really are starting like okay i'm done now yeah right <laughs> flop flop <laughs> flopping down is now the time to cut back perennials or do we want to wait even further for them to you die can, down you can if they have um seed heads on them you might want to leave them for the birds um but you can prune them back um usually well some depends on how tidy you want to be <laughs> in i'm a tidy kind i yeah. know you are <laughs> So then go right ahead. <laughs> a lot of times I'll wait until spring and then clean it all up at one time, but it, it's up to you how you want to do it. Ryan, do you mark where they are so you don't inadvertently I, dig it, them off then? Because yes, I've done that. Oh, I, I do that all the time. And I do that, you know, with the bulbs. Like, you know, we've talked about the planting, planting the bulbs this time of year that sure. I inadvertently go dig something <laughs> sure, up and, sure. and find them later. Right, right. Well, I've marked all the hostas because I've snapped off so many oh, hostas yeah. Yeah. in the spring when I'm cleaning up the garden right. and they're so tender then right oh yeah um, so it's nice to know what's there right but that is probably a good good tip now sure. as you're going and starting to cut back these the perennials is to kind of make notes and yeah. mark what was where or things that you might want to move later right and i i have um quite a bit of clumping bamboo some of it did not make it this last winter oh. which wow. surprises me some did and uh, quite a bit really didn't. Some of it's coming back. But anyway, I used those bamboo stakes, sticks to um, mm -hmm. snap and mark, mark everything. And it looks more organic. Right, <laughs> instead of a big of white plastic label or something. Or something with <laughs> yeah. a flag on yeah. it. Right. Right, right. Yeah. 
Well, speaking of cleaning up, so is it pros and cons to like cleaning, like say your vegetable beds, cleaning totally and leaving it bare, or should you put like leaves on it or cover crop? You can put a mulch on, you can plant uh, a cover crop, uh, you can put landscape cloth on it. Just uh, usually I just put leaves on leaves on. We're free, that's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And they'll just dissolve back into the soil and they you will. just turn it? Yeah. And then what is a cover crop if somebody's interested in that? Well, there's quite a few different ones. There's some clover, there's field peas, there's um, some of the ones can actually uh, fix nitrogen in the soil so that it, it actually improves your soil. Oh. So there's quite a few. Get them in pretty soon. Um, and I find that uh, that feed stores have the best selection. Mm. That's so, a great idea. Yeah. You're talking about um, cutting back uh, perennials. Uh, for spring blooming perennials, if you were to cut back now, you could be cutting off some of the bloom, correct? Well, I mean, if you're talking about shrubs, shrubs it's different yes. than perenni yeah. perennials per se. So uh, with uh, spring blooming shrubs, you cut them back after they flower. Um, with most of the perennials, if you cut them back now, they're going to come back for you and flower when they're ready. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, like on bulbs, you let the foliage stay on until it's totally dormant right. because it's sucking that nutrients back into the tree. Right. Are perennials more like that or do they... They're not like a bulb because they're not feeding, the foliage isn't feeding a bulb, it's feeding the root system. Uh, so it, it is different. Uh. And then uh, what about roses? Because they're, they're a perennial and they're a shrub, so where do they fall? Well, you, at this time of year or between now and say December, um, you trim shrub roses like hip high so they don't rock in the soil in uh, winter winds. Um, but then you don't prune them hard until February-ish. Depends on if you believe the President's <laughs> Day. <laughs> right. Uh, theory so uh, and there's different kinds of roses too there's mm -hmm. climbers that uh, with a climber I just try to keep it where I want it <laughs> timing doesn't usually make much difference right right, right. Yeah. Well. And then there's things you know like in my pots and containers on my porch as I'm transitioning them from my summer annuals I have a lot of things like begonias and things like that that have like the tubers or the the bulbs that are in there what do I do with those over the winter? Do I leave them in the pot in the hope, or can I do something? You can leave them in the pot protected, and they'll usually be okay. Uh, you can put them in a, like a peat mulch or something and just let them over winter and repot them in the spring. Um, I learned that my neighborhood rabbit really likes begonias <laughs> this year. Um, and I bought the same exact plant that I loved it so much. And when I came back from from a trip there, it was sort of stems, and that was they it. Loved it too. Yeah, they loved <laughs> it. Aren't you nice to feed but them? But that's okay. You know, <laughs> I, there's enough for everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the, th the things like the begonias, you could lift after they're done, lift those bulbs, and then store them. Sure, sure. And then like uh, geraniums, so over winter uh, geraniums, you can pull them from the soil. Um, hang them upside down in your garage without any soil on them, and they'll likely uh, survive. Depends on what kind of winter we right. are going to have. But you can also leave them in pots. If you have a protected area or a greenhouse, you can cut them way back and then just leave them and hardly water them at all. Don't, don't, don't assume that they're going to grow because they're just going to go dormant. Yeah. It's a fun experiment, I yeah. think. You know, yeah. you just see what happens, and then in the spring, you're either surprised or you go out and buy more. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. And Everything's then, an experiment. Yeah. <laughs> would, now, would dahlia tubers fall <clears throat> into that category, too? Because, I mean, a lot of them are still, still blooming right now. Right. Well, you usually wait the till they die down, and which is going to be a while still. Yeah. Um, many people dig them all, but you, if you dig them in the fall, you can't replant them till spring. So that's a big pain, I think. Yeah, and if you're willing to do it, that's fine. But I don't know that I really want to write each kind on the tuber. And anyway, so I planted a lot of dahlias a couple years ago and went, hey, good luck. Yeah, 
yeah. survival of the fittest. Yeah. And, come and back great. really, so I lost so some, but most of them came back just fine. And we we cut them back, but you'll notice when you cut back a pretty good sized stalk on a dahlia, it, it sort of has a hollow center to it. Mm -hmm. And you don't want that to be exposed to rain and have water go down inside and rot the tuber. So mulch them well and make sure that cut that you've made to cut them back is covered up. Now, we have to remind people that we are a garden show that's in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Right. And when we were at Swan Island Dahlias, which grow and distribute uh, dahlia tubers around the country, around the world, they recommend if you're in those certain areas that you dig them and store them. Right. Here we don't have to we, worry about right. that too much. Or maybe I should have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I, I've lost, we've lost some, yeah. and and a lot of times for us it's moisture. It's not necessarily the cold. Right. Whereas other parts of the country right. it could be a combination of both or one of the yeah, other. Yeah, we're in the maritime Pacific Northwest here, and um, I know we have a lot of viewers that are from everywhere. One per, uh, from Argentina yeah. that mm -hmm. watches. Yeah, right. and so you're off by six months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to me, uh, yes, uh, some basic gardening information is great, but make sure that you're getting local suggestions from an extension service or agricultural service so that you're doing what's right for your climate. And in the United States, almost every state, I think every state has an extension service. Mm -hmm. and, every uh, county. Yeah. Yeah. And so just check in your areas. If you don't live in the United States, you can always check with your local garden center or the local university right. um, in your area. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, next. Oh, I, I love your tip that you have for us all about leaves because I think people <laughs> think that leaves are such a pain, but you embrace leaves. They're, <laughs> they're gold. Here. Yes, they are. They're fertilizer yeah. and they're, they're um, an addition to soil that breaks your soil down and, and helps with that. Um, so my, my poor neighbor who moved in across the street, new, new neighbor, came over to help me one day and was blowing all my leaves out the driveway and across the street so he could pick them up for me. Oh. <laughs> poor guy. I went out and said, oh, no, I want them this way. Anyway, so he never did that again. <laughs> but and, and it, but it, they, the natural mulch, as somebody said, you can pay the recycling company oh. to come and take it away and then pay them to bring it back when it's right. compost. So right. Or you can just do it all yourself. Well, and, and I don't really compost that much. I mean, I do, but um, with the leaves, I just blow them onto the flower beds. And, and sort of a myth is that, well, yeah, but then you've got all these places for these, for the insect pests to yeah. to survive. Well, guess what? The beneficial insects do as well. The ones that are parasitic insects that take True. take a wasp and anyway, <laughs> uh, I won't describe the whole program. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, so it, to me, I've never had considered having them on a problem. And then in the spring, when things are starting to pop, I pull off the leaves and then I use them in the vegetable garden usually, uh, but so that the, the soil will warm up. So faster. I have that nice, tidy, blow all the leaves in the, in the bed, and then the birds come and start scratching yeah. through, and pretty soon the leaves are out of the bed again. So I find about middle of the winter, I have to go back and rake everything back <laughs> into the beds. Use a leaf slower, and you know, don't have to do that. <laughs> but I like to think that I'm helping nature because I'm providing a food source. Oh, right. Right. And, and yeah, habitat, because obviously right. the birds are yeah. searching for something. And right. sure. Sure. You're sure. making it easy for them. Sure. Well, and like the chicken <clears throat> coconut that I that used to live yeah, next, next door, door. Mm -hmm. she followed me around the yard, and there weren't hardly any insect pests. She just, anything I scratched up, she took it. Oh. Yeah, so that was a good yeah. one. Yeah, borrow chickens. Yep. Right. But what about um, leaves on lawns? Because that's the one you really want to take off, or depends? Yeah, well, yes and I mean, yes. Eventually, <laughs> they're going to smother your lawn if it's they're very thick. But I love to see that I have a red sunset maple, oh, and pretty. the whole front lawn is that pinky, orangey, red color. And I'm not going to run out there and break them all up, I want to look at them for a while. Mm -hmm. and, but I do before 
it, they smother the lawn and, and start to compact on them. And that's probably important to remember to enjoy your yard. Don't think of it as right. a, oh, a lot, lot of work, right. but if you kind of rethink what you're looking at, there's a lot of lot going on in the yard and a lot of changes that are Absolutely. happening. Absolutely. There's it. another thing that I might bring up and that is when you mow your lawn and I don't doesn't make any difference if it's now or all summer long. I'm, I know the tidy people like to <laughs> have not pointing fingers, right? <laughs> <laughs> to to rake, it, rake it up and make it look really nice after you've mowed. But you don't have to do that unless it's wet and clumps right. and then it'll smother your lawn. But um, you're hauling off the nitrogen. And if you leave the cuttings on and you mow often enough, um, that it did, they'll just dry up and keep fertilizing. The other thing to do, and this I know we're talking fall here, but um, don't go in and think, okay, if I really set the mower down and just cut it as short as I can, I'm not going to have to mow anymore <laughs> this year. But it's, that's not, not the way it works. Mm. Let it be healthy and uh, develop itself. So speaking of lawns, I always think of sprinkler systems. So do we have to do something for our sprinkler systems, our drips for winter time? Because it's going to get cold, we might get freezing temperatures. I'm not really the person to ask. <laughs> well, when you were I, teaching. <laughs> I, I, well, I didn't, yeah, it wasn't my fa favorite thing because um, I haul sprinklers around. Oh, so I exercise? don't, all I know is that if you have a sprinkler system, you need to check it a couple times a year. Check it in the spring when you're ready to water again and, and hire somebody who knows what they're doing. Okay. I know. Really that, um, years ago, we did a story. I'm not sure if Judy <coughs> did the story or not. And we talked to a, an irrigation specialist, yeah. and they came in with um, a, a compressor and essentially blew the water out right. of the system. Right. Um, and then, of course, you know, um, backflow devices; those need to be checked, mm -hmm. especially in the spring. Uh, right. A backflow device keeps your uh, water and your hoses from going back into the water system and to your neighbor's house. Um, so those need to be checked if you have a sprinkler system as sure. well. So. And as your landscape matures, the sprinkler system isn't going to work for 30 right. years yeah. the same way. Mm -hmm. You're going to end up wanting to make sure that the water is still getting to the places that you intend. Yep. And then going along that same line of irrigation, uh, covering your outdoor spigots, uh, uh, draining and putting away your garden hoses, those are all good things yeah. because any water that's left is going to just expand in the frost and crack yeah. and yeah. cause problems later. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, and it's you know it's taking notes in your yeah. garden too. Yeah, I mean we talk we talk about that often, mm -hmm. but it's really a time to survey what your yard did this year, what worked, what right. didn't. Even right. if it's not time to maybe dig and move and divide things, but take notes while we're, they're mm -hmm. still up. Right. You know, of how big something got that, okay, you know, that's I need that's going to need to yeah. get moved or right. smaller down. Because I know I had things that grew up this year that are now blocking a sprinkler. Right. And now I don't get the coverage mm -hmm. that I need to, so I need to do do something different come, come spring. Yeah. And we hear so much about fall is for planting. So if we're getting into late fall, early winter, if we have good days, you could still plant? As long as you can get a shovel in the soil, you can plant. I mean, if it's frozen, it's yeah, not going to no. work. I'm not going to bother uh, anyway. <laughs> but it, it gives um, that root system a chance to settle in and develop over the winter, even though it doesn't seem like it would. They do, and, and you get a much better start in the spring. Because mm -hmm. right now the soil temperatures are still, still nice, yeah. and, nice and warm. Yeah. You know, maybe cooling off sure. there, but down below where right. those roots are, yeah. they're still... Yeah. They're still getting established, so right. come, come springtime, you just have that much of a growth out of it. Right, mm -hmm. and then what happens too is if you decide not to plant and you leave stuff in the container at, until the next season, they can get root bound, and by the time you get them planted, sure. they're not happy. They're right. very stressed. No, true. Yeah. Okay. Or they could freeze in that pot. Well, sure. Because they're not going to be in that soil volume right. in the ground, so you might lose what you just bought. So. Right. Well, that's what I do with those leaves that we talk about every year um, is I take every, literally almost every pot that I think will survive the winter, put it against the south side of the garage and put all those leaves on top. 
and then try to remember to take them off before they right. start <laughs> to grow. Yes, yeah. um, so far, fertilization, a lot of people, you know, we talk about through, through the growing season, fertilizing. Now, is it necessary to fertilize? I know that some people will put a fall and winter fertilizer on their grass, but for the most of the garden, it's as, no, you don't want to promote new growth. Right, for the grass, it does help to get it to be as healthy as possible to go through the winter. Um, and then with shrubs, usually shrubs and plants, perennials, etc., in the garden, when the new growth starts is when you're more apt to do the fertilization than now. Cool. What, anybody, I don't else? know. I'm looking. I think hey. we've covered everything. Janet, soil give, give us samples. again a, a, a list. A lovely She's cheat, like, cheat lovely. sheet of all the yes, things you're supposed you. to do. Um, well, oh, soil sample? Yeah. A soil sample? That's a good idea? Um, it, it used to be, and I, I'm not up on it as much now as I once was, uh, as far as the university would do a soil, you mm. could send a soil test in. And I think that's not happening anymore, and I think it's private, private laboratories that are doing the soil test. There's, when people say soil test, a lot of times they just mean pH mm -hmm. yes. and not necessarily right. the nutrients that are in the soil. And so, it helps to know, let's put it this way, rhododendrons, blueberries, acid-loving plants, like a soil around 4.5 to 5, and, and vegetables like a 6, and some plants like more of an alkaline soil. So knowing that first helps, and you can do just a pH test, um, and especially if a plant that you have isn't doing very well, you might find out. But if you want, it doesn't hurt at all to do a full-blown uh, soil test for nutrients. Um, one gentleman came into our office one time and with the results, and he had horrendous numbers of potassium. Oh. It, 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 he dried bananas, and he saved the peels and threw them on his compost and then used his compost and it was so high in potassium, he was killing stuff. Oh. Wow. And um, so you might wanna, mm -hmm. you want, want that banana peel to break down first. You don't just throw them, you know, eggshells or right. for calcium or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh. So knowing what's in your soil is, is helpful, especially if, if, if a, health, a plant looks healthy, you probably don't have to worry about it. It's mm -hmm. amazing because people will do that. They'll just apply. They've been told to fertilize three times a year or whatever, yeah. and mm -hmm. they just go out whether their soil needs it or not. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what to do this month, you may not have to do it, what <laughs> right. to yeah. do this month. Mm -hmm. You may not need to. Yeah. These are just suggestions of yeah. things you can look for, things right. that may work. Right. Right. I mean, right. you could go crazy trying to do <laughs> everything. Right. Well, this right. brings up the, the whole point of um, talking about what we should do, what's university-based research, and what's garden myths. Uh, so yeah. we're gonna take a little break now. Um, and when we come back, we're gonna address some of those garden myths that we've all been reading about. <laughs> so we'll take a break and we'll be right back. <laughs> Capital Subaru knows the details matter to you. And that's why you chose a Subaru for their top safety ratings and well-earned reputation. Capital Subaru has the Valley's largest inventory of new and used vehicles, but we're so much more than just a great dealership. Check out some of our amazing relaxation spaces, like our Happy Heart Coffee Cart, the Outback Dog Park, or our fantastic Happy Paws Pet Store. It's all here at Capital Subaru, your place to expect the unexpected. Your way, every day, on the Parkway. For 75 years, Owl's Garden and Home has been a favorite destination of local gardeners. Starting in a small roadside fruit stand off of 99E in Woodburn by Al Biggie, Owl's has grown to four retail locations in the Portland metro area that also includes a huge growing operation near Hubbard. To ensure that you get the highest quality, Owl's grows over 80% of the plants they sell. This fourth generation family owned business is now one of the most recognized garden centers in the country. Stop by one of our four locations to learn why Owls is the first stop for Northwest Gardeners.
And welcome back to Garden Time. We're with Jan McNeilan, retired OS, Oregon State University Extension agent. And we just talked about fall tips. And um, when we give tips, they're all generally research-based. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've gone through trials. Scientists at the university level have checked them out, and so these tips are good. Yet there are myths that that live out there that exist. <laughs> they do. <laughs> and it's very frustrating, um, especially for research-based people, when they see something, oh, I saw this on the internet, or I read this, or, um, you know, my grandmother did this. Let's talk about a few of those. I know you have a list there. What do you got off the top? Because we were just talking about fall fertilizing and application of lime we talked about before. Is that something that we should be doing? And does it benefit? Yes, it can if you're trying to keep the pH of your soil um, where grass likes it, around six. Um, but as far as a lot of people apply lime thinking that's going to get rid of moss, and it, it doesn't. Uh, the moss is there in your lawn because of shade or really, really wet soils. Um, the lime is not going to change that at all. It'll change the pH of the soil that your grass is growing in, but it isn't going to get rid of the moss. And for people in the United States, the Northwest where we are, moss is. Moss, moss. Maine yeah. is like this, I guess. <laughs> moss is just moss. And it's, yeah. it's, sure, it's part sure. Of it's yeah. something gardeners deal with. Yeah, here, so. Right. So it, it can be applied, certainly, uh, but only if your grass isn't growing well. And it, it may not even need to be applied every year by any means. Like every three years would probably be enough. Wow. So there's that yeah. pH test like we were yeah. talking earlier. So you yeah. might want to do that just to be sure. Right. You're not right. doing extreme. Right. But what about lime? I always add lime to my, my tomato bed. Is it beneficial to do that now here? At this time of year, should I wait until the springtime when you I plant? You really need to put it in the planting hole with the tomato. So wait. Because it's making all your soil um, with that much calcium in it uh, will actually um, not help some plants. Okay. So just don't forget because of... Right. I'll put it in my blo calendar. <laughs> blossom end rot is a problem. Mm -hmm. It's going into winter when I mean, you get so much rain. Right. right. It's, it's just, just, just going to wash it, wash it out. Right. Okay. Right. Put it on the calendar. Thank yeah. you. But you know, if we're, if we're talking about, you know, adjusting pHs and putting lime, what about the opposite, where we want to go, you know, put more acid, acid. in the bed? You know, a lot of people, oh, let's pile all my pine needles in, into the bed. Right. <laughs> well, and, and that's what some people think, that pine needles or fir needles or cedar or whatever will make the soil very acid. It doesn't. They break down, and they're on the surface. So um, it, really, it really doesn't make that much difference whatever the conifer is that's dropping. But it could make a nice mulch. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you could use it as a mulch over the top or till it in or dig it in to the soil just to add more organic matter. Right. But don't don't expect a big pH changes by no. adding a bunch of no. pine yeah. needles. No. Okay, uh, no All right. other myth? Okay, oh, pruning, I think this is a good one. People, you know, they plant the wrong tree in the wrong place, and it's so big now that it's having problems with wires or eaves or whatever, and so they think they can just top it and just top the top, and kind of what happens when you do that? Well, topping, you, there's lots of different methods of pruning. There's pollarding um, so that a tree is always kept in a lollipop round mm -hmm. round ball um, what you don't want to do well we also see the streets when the crews come through and they're going to take it out yeah. to make sure it doesn't I interfere with the wires and plants can can survive that but what are they they don't look like no. what was planted originally right. um, and the thing that as far as topping some people years ago i don't think it's as Ha happens as much now, topping a conifer like a grand fir, a Douglas fir, a cedar, to keep it from falling during windstorms. Oh. And that was done a lot in the 60s and 70s. Mm. Uh, we had a mailman in our neighborhood 
who had nine children and and everyone in the neighborhood felt like we needed to give him extra work so he <laughs> topped trees oh. <laughs> he topped fir trees and so now my whole neighborhood is filled with trees that have multiple leaders oh. and those are the ones that are going to fall in a windstorm the other thing that it's hard to explain sometimes is that trees are communities they protect each other so a neighbor two houses up lost a spruce tree one year the next door neighbor it, these were all very old trees they weren't young at all the next do door neighbor then lost a pin oak huge pin oak snapped in the top because it no longer had the protection from the other tree and after their pin oak was gone we lost a birch a big birch huge birch and so what happens is that that protective community was disrupted mm. so going in to take out a whole lot of trees is actually going to make you more susceptible to wind damage than leaving it alone and when you when you go to top it it's not like it's just going to stop growing at that right. height right yeah, no. these certain plants are pro pro programmed to yeah, right. become Keep a certain right. height right? right so it's exactly now it's lost that and now it's got to go catch up and right. shoot much more well, the, i have a very old grand fir that has those multiple leaders because of that pruning years ago but it's a gorgeous tree and it's healthy at the top so i had it cabled so that the two leaders on the top are cabled together so they won't snap. Oh. Um, and that's expensive to do, but it's worth it in the long run. Yeah, and this is where you get the argument for a certified <laughs> arborist to come in and take a look at your mature mm -hmm. trees. Right. Because they're gonna create um, space for the wind to go through. Right. Remove the dead in and it. disease. Yes, and, absolutely. And somebody told me once, once you cut a tree, that's not it. I mean, once you prune something, you're going to have to go back and prune again mm. and again. So even if it's been a few years since your fir tree or, or pine have been cleaned up, yeah. it may be time to do it again. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, if there is a tree that is a problem that it, you think, oh, I need to top it, maybe you need to get an arborist and maybe it needs to be removed. Absolutely. And then plant something in a better position or get a better plant for that, the correct plant for that right. position. One that will mature into the area that you have and not be overgrown. Yeah, so sometimes it's like you have to cut bait. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. So the next myth I have is that we talk about adding compost to our, to our beds and adding more, and every year we just keep adding and adding and adding. Can that be a problem? Not really, um, because the more organic material you put in, if it becomes mm -hmm. all, I mean, if it's all compost, it's then yes, but as long as it is continually um, blended with the surrounding soil, it'll keep becoming uh, a good organic soil for you. Is there more to that one? Yeah, or can you, can you go too deep? Can you add too much at a time and bury something where you're going to, like on a tree, you're if you're over, over time, are you gonna uh, collar it and add and add and add where eventually it's kinda of gonna smother out the collar of that tree? Right. Definitely. So P you see sometimes people change the grade of their landscape and then they come in and take it down, uh, say a foot, and then they put a, a little bricks or <laughs> whatever around it and make a new bed. Or they come in and bring more soil in against that uh, bark. And that is, that'll kill the tree. That's why when we tell people how to plant a new plant, you plant it at the soil level it was in the pot. Because mm -hmm. you don't want to do that, that for a new plant, but you also don't want to change that for a mature plant. Yeah. All right. Oh, I love this one about bee houses. So we love the bees. I mean, and I think it's been great. Everybody is now cognizant about protecting bees and right. planting for the bees and, right. you know, really, you know, being good stewards in our gardens, but, um, and people put up mason bee houses to kind of attract them to your garden. So is that a good thing? Sure. Um, the more we have, the better. 
just keep in mind that most bees are ground dwelling bees that so you can put up all sorts of bee houses but it unless you have plants that attract them um, they're not going to be there anyway um, I didn't know much years ago about uh, mason bees and yes we make the mason bee houses but we ha had and I realized a mason bee using the keyhole in the of my 1941 house every year <laughs> and here comes this and I always thought I never even paid much attention to it I always thought it was a fly or something you know and fa and I went ah it's a mason bee it's been living in the keyhole of the garage all these years not the same one but <laughs> <laughs> well and an mason elderly mason bee <laughs> Well, mason bees are different than honey bees because it's yes. not a hive; they're solitary. No. Right, and they and they come out earlier yeah, than the nice. other bees do too. And there's so many wild bees. Yes, I mean, and you don't even notice them because, like you said, they look like flies or they're small. And, yeah, unless and there's really little out there. tiny, um, little tiny wasp-looking critters that also pollinate. Yellow jackets pollinate. They go to eat something on a plant. And the, and then they go to the next plant, and they're they're pollinating too, not the same way that the bees right. collect the pollen. But mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of good good critters out there. So that's the moral of the story. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting too because bumbles um, are solitary and, mm. and ground they dwelling. Are ground dwelling. Yeah. And uh, people were noticing more bumblebees the beginning of this year, before the honeybees came out. So. I mean, every little bit helps, and well, so the, maybe keeping that garden too clean it could be. That, well, <laughs> that's Gail Angelato, who's uh, who who was the state leader for Master Gardener, now is still in the department, and her love is pollinating mm -hmm. insects. Oh, yeah. And um, you bet, she she says if you're going to be neat. Here she <laughs> goes, look at, looking at me again. <laughs> If you're going to be neat in the garden, you want everything perfect, just leave one bed that's not so that the beneficial insects have a place to crawl under and uh, winter over. I remember uh, Berry Botanic Garden here in Portland, um, when they were still open, they're now closed, they would leave piles of sticks in mm -hmm. un, um, untouched areas or right. throughout the garden Sure. just for those um, pollinators and other insects that sure. were beneficial. Sure. All right, what's okay, next? next one I got. Tree roots go only as far as the drip line. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so the drip line, for people who don't know, that's the extent of your leaves or your foliage. The outside. And that's the yeah. outside of the tree where it drips. And, and, they, and some of them do, uh, and some plants do. Uh, and so when you read something that says fertilize around the drip line, if you know that that's where it is, is on that perimeter of the of the leaves, uh, but sometimes it's you know it's 30 feet that way. And you're past that. Well, it, right. I had a lady bring a bucket of roots into the office once, and she said, "I want to know what kind of tree this is." So I, said, <laughs> I have no idea, and, and so um, she. But the reason she wanted to know is that there were a bunch of roots in her garden that she was convinced were coming from her neighbors. So she wanted to know what kind of tree it is so that she could tell them oh. <laughs> about <laughs> the roots. Get their so, tree roots out of her yard? Yeah. And like a, um, let me think, a, a locust tree, which is not my favorite tree, but it'll spread, it'll spread 30, 40 feet and shoot up another tree. Oh, wow. I mean, yeah. th they're, I mean, so it's not the drip, the drip line isn't the only thing right. to think about. Yeah. But speaking of roots, there's so much interesting new um, uh, investigation and research about tree roots and how they intertwine each other and they send each other messages yeah. and things. Yeah. It's been fascinating. Yeah. So it's they're, good that they kind of yeah. mingle around. Yeah. Um, you know, you're talking about the tree roots too. So would people fertilize? Go back to those fall fertilizing and even spring fertilizing. When you're fertilizing, you're not just fertilizing one area. You could be fertilizing many plants mm -hmm. right. in, that, in that vicinity, trees, right. shrubs. Right. Right. You know, I th oh, I put in bulb food and everything seems to be responding in that area. Wow, okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it depends on how big a yard you have. Yeah. I mean, you could be <laughs> putting a train load on, on your landscape. 
Um, so again, backing up to say, I don't fertilize everything in the yard. And so if it's doing well, or at least it's reasonably well, then maybe you don't have to fertilize at all. Or use your tree leaves that you just raked into your bed. Mm -hmm. fertilize my it. own <laughs> private uh, fertilizer stash. Yep, yeah. my yep. organic matter. Judy, what do you got? All right, <clears throat> I have heard about Epsom salts. I think I've been in this business a long time and it's like I've never used them and hear about them all the time. And it's, it's just so funny it's, it, that it's a myth, but you hear about it all the time. I mean, I soak my feet in Epsom salts. Or on your plants when you're done. <laughs> so this is a re reference to tomatoes, correct? Or yes, they're okay. great for tomatoes. Okay. Well, and also it's mentioned for roses. Too. And roses, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, bottom line, you can have all the scientific whatever information you can, but if Grandma always threw her soapy water out the back door of the kitchen and her roses were there and she never had aphids there was a reason for that but it maybe doesn't sound scientific it's just what grandma always did so sometimes you can tell somebody that doesn't really work and and they'll tell you that it does mm -hmm. and it, if it's not hurting anything then uh, go ahead i mean but it's it's the magnesium in the Epsom salts that will uh, can green up the leaves of roses too. But you have to be careful though of doing it too much. Right. You know you'd only need like a a tablespoon right. or a little handful for a plant. It yeah. doesn't take much. Because it's is that considered like you hear about micronutrients in soil or in for plants? So for then they're magnesium. not going to need a lot of it. Yeah. No. And that's. Another reason why a, com a full-blown soil test will, sure. will let you know, mm -hmm. and let you know what what you have yeah. and what needs looking at. So I'll save that water next time I soak my. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> why not? So what about spiders? <laughs> <laughs> so brown recluse and hobo spiders. Yeah. The myth is that there are plentiful and common in Oregon. Um, the hobo spiders are aggressive house spider which most of the there's several hobo type spiders um there's a large one that people it's like the size of a 50 cent piece or a silver dollar and that scares people big time oh, yeah i had a lady bring a spider to be identified in a jar in a jar in another jar <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's taking canning to the <laughs> 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 Um, I have not heard that brown recluse are in Oregon at all. They may be, and they may have traveled from somewhere else, but the, mainly the bites that people talk about are not brown recluse. The only brown recluse I knew about was in Medford about 25 years ago that came from a radio that moved from South Carolina. Um, so uh, I don't know, I mean, I this is where you say, I don't know, but I'll find out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we have lots of spiders, and they're usually beneficial to the environment. Spiders. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. That, um, there's two camps here. There's those that go, oh, it's Charlotte. And, and, another, <laughs> and somebody else will uh, say, yeah. <clears throat> actually, I won't name them, but uh, somebody I know pretty well literally a big huge guy will jump up on a chair if he oh. sees a spider wow so it's how and you that's not me no <laughs> <laughs> no i'll Don't let be looking at me again on that one. <laughs> i'll let him know no, a snake you. that's a different story but, yeah. <laughs> but i'll tell you what spiders are great in the fall because you get the workout you burn off those calories doing the ninja moves when you yeah. walk right. through the garden. <laughs> the and that's when i notice them when fall's coming for me right. it's not just the changing of the color yeah. it's the spider webs because right. they're trying to get those last meals right. for their eggs. Right. And They're so you walk out and, and it's like, sometimes it is. Yeah. I do my karate moves going through the garden. <laughs> right. Yeah. And their yeah. Halloween decoration. Yeah. There you and, go. And this brings <laughs> up the thing, too, about insects coming in. I mean, w it's cold, it's wet, it's yeah. miserable. Spiders, ants, all kinds of those sure. stink bugs. Ladybugs. Uh, yeah. Box elder bugs. 
all those animals are now going to come in because we're warm and dry and that's right. what they want to be. And what you don't want to use in your home is insecticides inside. Um, so if on the years where the box elder bugs by the thousands come in and drop out of your light fixture in the dining room or whatever, a vacuum is the best you can, you can do. And actually, if they're outside and bothering you, um, just hose them off the wall, discourage them. There were so many one year, we were getting so many calls on the Master Gardener hotlines that we started asking people where they lived and what color the house was. We were trying to come up with some sort of commonality there, but we, I mean, the phone would, you just let go and it ring again and let go and ring again. There were so many. Wow. And I, that can really freak out a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And some of those uh, home remedies don't always work, but some of them do. Yeah. Um, but sometimes it's just as easy to just trap them and, like you said, or suck them up. and Right. Or right. in the case of a spider, just re catch it and release it, you yep. know, if sure. you want outside. Sure. Or the cats Not a snake, like to though. play with them. <laughs> yeah, no. Not a snake, yeah. Um, any other myths that we have? Well, I have a, a really great one, but it's not the time of season for it, but we'll remember next year. So it's about watering on hot sunny days. <laughs> it's a hot day, it's 95 degrees, and should I water? I just say to people, water when you have time. <laughs> and, um, and it really doesn't, it doesn't, like if a bead of water is on that leaf, it's not like you're holding a magnifying glass over it. It actually can help. Some plants can take take in moisture and water, not just with the roots. So, um, no, I would say, I mean, if you've got a choice, you're not going to want to be out there on the hottest time of the day anyway. Mm -hmm. But um, you don't you don't have to not water just because of well, it used to be said, and it maybe still is that if you water you water early in the morning and let your plants dry so that they don't end up with more disease. I don't know. I mean, yeah. uh, roses, yeah, roses get um, black spot, roses get mildew, etc. But now with new plants, more and more plants are being developed that are resistant to some of these things mm -hmm. that we fight. So we can get out there and we're not going to have sun or uh, water burns on our plants no, if we water on hot you're days. You're more likely to get sunburn period when it needs water True. than when it doesn't. Or winter burn from wind. Oh, and so that's a thing too. So yeah. we should water if it's been dry and we get cold and... It protects um, the roots, yes. Ah. But usually, in our part of the country here, that usually isn't the case. Mm -hmm. But there's many other, uh, many other areas that they're they don't get as much rain as we do. Yeah. Um, so that's I, all the oh, that's, that's all the mess I have. <laughs> so uh, I have so another list. I have one. Uh, <laughs> so we talked about uh, weed control. So a lot of people will, will still want to keep the control of their weeds, and they're using like pure vinegars or something like that. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I always thought that uh, anything in that concentration is. It's going to change your soil pH. Yes. Yeah. And so if you plant, there's two ways to look at it. If that's a weed in a draw, rocky driveway that I want to get rid of and not dig out, sure, you can put vinegar on it and it's going to kill it. But if it's an area that you're trying to weed and you're going to put plants back in, that doesn't work because mm -hmm. um, that soil is so acidic that any new plant is not going to do well. Well, you're talking about um, synthetic versus organic chemicals. Um, whatever you buy in a, in a garden center that has those labels on the back, those have been tested yes. for that strength right. applied in the, in the recommended application on that label. And anything above beyond that, it's going to be just as bad as anything else that you throw Right. Yeah. It's being, saying it's natural or organic. Uh, a natural pesticide is... Um, tobacco you could put tobacco that used to be done a lot um, put it in water and make a tea out of it and spray it on your plants okay it kills insects and it might just kill you because it's very toxic to humans as well mm -hmm. as the insects so 
you really making something up from what's under the kitchen sink it, or a tobacco leaf um, is you need to do your homework and you need if you're looking on the internet you need to to look at trusted sites university sites um, and those that 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 you know are research-based and then you're okay but if you believe everything that you're going to see you'll end up with some issues well, Jan, thank you so much. Um, we're sitting here in Portland Nursery in their indoor plant section. It has this tropical feel. Mm -hmm. And it's almost as if we were in Spain or Portugal. <laughs> and Jan just got back from Portugal. I but did. But this is a shameless plug for Garden Time. <laughs> we now have a tour to Spain and Portugal for the fall of 2024 and possibly some tours after that. So go to gardentime.tv, uh, click on the little airplane on our website. Um, so Jan, how was Portugal? She went over um, for painting and drawing. I went over for an artist retreat and uh, in Luso, Portugal, which is a three and a half hour train ride out of Lisbon. And it was in a teeny tiny little town. And there were 11 of us and we spent two weeks. And it's, it's great. I have lots of good stuff about Portugal because I'm going with you guys yeah. for sure <laughs> yeah um, so we're going to be starting in Barcelona next year um, in September and we'll see Madrid and we'll go to Alham Alhambra the, the gardens there in uh, Grenada um, Seville Lisbon mm -hmm. we're going to be seeing all those sites so if you're interested in joining us um, there's some uh, pricing information the uh, whole itinerary is on the Garden Time website but we've been to Spain and I can't wait to go back yeah. because uh, life there is a whole different pace. And it is. Um, it's. Don't bring your watch. Don't bring uh. your watch, exactly. Well, except for catching the bus to the next yeah. hotel. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, just yeah, wake up calls at the hotels are recommended. But other than that, <laughs> oh, yeah. So, it's great. Um, it'll be wonderful. But thank you yeah. so much again, Jan, for uh, joining us. Um, for more information about um, some of these tips and some of these myths, contact your local uh, university extension service. Master Gardener program, or you can go to gardentime.tv if you live in the uh, Oregon, Washington area. We'll have links to the extension service here for, their, for you to look up. So uh, we thank you again for joining us and happy gardening. Hi, I'm Sarah with Portland Nursery where our passion for plants has kept us rooted in this incredible community. A lot has changed since we first opened our doors, but through it all, we've remained family owned and operated, dedicated to providing our neighbors the largest selection of the highest quality plants Portland has to offer. With hundreds of new plants arriving each week, you're guaranteed to find something exciting and unique. Portland Nursery, a passion for plants at 50th and Stark, 90th and Division. Capital Subaru knows the details matter to you, and that's why you chose a Subaru for their top safety ratings and well-earned reputation. Capital Subaru has the Valley's largest inventory of new and used vehicles, but we're so much more than just a great dealership. Check out some of our amazing relaxation spaces, like our Happy Heart Coffee Cart, the Outback Dog Park, or our fantastic Happy Paws Pet Store. It's all here at Capital Subaru, your place to expect the unexpected. Your way, every day, on the Parkway. Garden time is on the road again. Join us as we tour Spain and Portugal in September and October of 2024. We start in vibrant Barcelona, where we'll see some of Gaudi's best work, including a tour of La Sagrada Familia Basilica. Then we head to Valencia for a couple of days of touring Roman and Arabian architecture, seeing various markets and a little paella thrown in to tempt your palate. Our next stop is the city of Granada, where we'll take a tour of the famous Alhambra and its wonderful gardens. Then it's on to a couple days in Seville, the cultural capital of Spain. We'll walk through the massive cathedral with Columbus's tomb and enjoy an evening of flamenco. The Moorish city of Cordoba and the Mesquita are next, with its wonderful mix of Spanish and Islamic influences. After this extraordinary stop, we jump on the AVE high-speed train and head to Madrid for a couple days. Our visit to Madrid will find us in the historic center of the city, with stops to see the Puerta del Sol and the Prado Museum. A side trip to historic Toledo, the medieval capital of Spain, is a stop on our way to Portugal. 
We finish our tour with three days in Lisbon, where we'll tour the palaces and gardens of royalty. Stops here include the Monument to the Discoveries and the Tower of Belém. We also have a day trip to the wonderful medieval town of Obidos. If you'd love to spend more time here, there are extensions available before and after our tour. Local transportation, hotels, and 20 of your meals are included. Book now as these Garden Time Tours fill up quickly. Go to Garden Time Tours on our website and click on the little airplane for more information. And we'll see you in Europe.